This week's episode is made possible by our friends at Independent Bank. You can learn more about them at i-bankonline.com. Good morning, Memphis. You're listening to Meanwhile in Memphis on WYXR Radio 91.7 FM. Meanwhile in Memphis is a program dedicated to conversations that celebrate the organizations, initiatives, and people that are shaping Memphis for the better. The Meanwhile in Memphis radio show and podcast are brought to you by New Memphis, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to develop, activate, and retain the city's most important resource, its people. Your hosts today are me, Rebecca Hamm, and my colleague, Anna Thompson. Before we jump into today's conversation, we have a couple of event reminders. Coming up is the new Memphis Leadership Summit on August 9th. This is a full-day conference designed with professional growth in mind. The new Memphis Leadership Summit is a perfect resource for teams and individuals to strengthen skills, gain new perspectives, and engage with other community members and organizations. You can find ticket pricing and information at newmemphis.org events. Also coming up is the TEDx Memphis Conference. TEDx The Mixtape is turning up the volume to amplify big ideas at this 901-of-a-kind live event experience on September 28, 2024. But don't miss out on the chance to get early bird tickets, which are only on sale through August 5th at TEDx-Memphis.com. They say don't judge a book by the cover. But what about libraries? Memphis is full of unique libraries that create access and opportunity, not only for knowledge through books, but also through experiences. Today, we're chatting with Anthony and Jenna of Memphis Public Libraries to share more about the access made possible through collaboration. Anthony Lucatelli and Jenna Pirtle are both librarians at Memphis Public Libraries. Let's welcome our guests to the studio. Good morning. Joining us today are Anthony and Jenna, and we want to get to know each of you and the work that you do here in Memphis. Jenna, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure thing. My name is Jenna Pirtle. I'm a native Memphian. I've lived here all my life. Um, I went to White Station High School and Go Spartans. Um, <laughs> and University of Memphis. Go Tigers. Uh, thank you. Uh, started off uh, in law, and then about six and a half years ago, knocked on the library's door and asked them to let me in, and I've been working there ever since. Um, I started off at uh, the Red Library, and I was the teen services librarian there um, for about five years. Um, Started a youth action council there and was able to start up the first teen innovation center um, that um, Memphis Public Libraries had which was awesome. And then I moved over about a year and a half ago to Central Library, where I am the teen librarian there on the humanities floor, located on the second floor. I partner with Cloud 901, uh, working with their Youth Action Council Center, or their teen lab, and um, I help their youth council at that department. Um, And some of the bigger things that I'm working on now our library of things and i'm one of the co-chairs to our annual comic-con event wow okay you do a lot already but i you've said a couple of things that i definitely want to um clarify so can you share what a youth action council is for those who might not know and similarly um the teen innovation center yeah so the youth action council is uh basically a council that we put together that usually consists of five to 10 teens. Um, Bridges USA actually helped uh, train us. And basically these teens get together to help us plan programming that they want to see at the library. And they help actually make the teen spaces at the libraries as well. So it was really important to us that whenever we're making something that we have them at the table because they are the ones that are going to know best what teens want. So um, yeah, I've been really proud to uh, be able to do that at the library. Exciting. That's like a really well-educated focus group to be able to tell you what to do. Absolutely. I mean, as an adult, I don't necessarily know what a teen wants to do. Absolutely. We run into that a lot. (laughs) So (laughs) yes, it's, it's fantastic being able to meet with them uh, every other week to get their insight on what teens really want to 
see at the library. I love to know that there's such inclusive and collaborative leadership happening. Um, and you mentioned that the support of Bridges in, in building that type of programming. We recently spoke with um, them about what it means to have effective inclusive leadership in the community. So it's nice to hear kind of a through line here for how that's happening in your work. Yeah, absolutely. Their their help has been tremendous. You also mentioned the Teen Innovation Center. So what is what does that look like? So our Teen Innovation Centers are centers in our libraries that are teen focused. Um, the purpose is to give teens a space where they feel comfortable, where they feel included, um, a space that they've had some sort of input in um, deciding what actually goes in there. So, um, for example, at the Red Library, we created a space where they can go to hang out, to study, but also there's a piano if they want to be able to um, just work on the keys, try to learn a new hobby. Um, we have a maker space where they can go and get like arts and crafts. Um, there's many things that they can do. We have like game nights there, or we used to, but there's like a switch there. And yeah, it's it's basically a space where they feel comfortable within the library, which I think was something that was lacking before. I've seen these. Um, so you mentioned the Red Library, like it's upstairs in that little area. Yes. And um, <laughs> my five-year-old wandered up there and I did see the signs that were like teens, you know, a 14. And I was like, this looks like a cool clubhouse. Mm -hmm. is what it really kind of felt like, like no adults allowed, you know, kind of like this is their space for them to do and be and learn. And that was really exciting. And then in the central library, it's like has the glass, right? The big. Oh, yeah. It's like a big deal. Again, my daughter was like, oh, like, look, there's a skateboard in there. I wanted to, I want to go see that. <laughs> and I was like, not for us. Again, <laughs> the sign says. But it's very exciting to know that there's a, even just a physical space to, for them. That's just for them. Okay, thank you. So, Anthony, back to you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what led you into a career in library sciences. Right. Um, I'm Anthony Lucatelli. I was born in Pennsylvania, but I moved down here to Memphis when I was like three, so I think I count as a Memphian. Uh, I went to school here. I went got my bachelor's and my master's in sociology at the University of Memphis, I went to Bolton Agricultural High School, uh, so I've been around, uh, grew up in the suburbs, I went to a school in the country, and then I went to university uh, here in the city. So uh, Definitely count. a chosen Memphian, for sure. Chosen Memphian, absolutely. I love it. So uh, what drew you to libraries? Libraries was a place I never expected I would end up. Really? Um, not for any particular reason, it just never occurred to me. All I ever really thought I wanted to do was something that be a public good of some kind. You know, you spend a lot of time in sociology just learning about social problems, but that doesn't always lead to clear answers. Mm. Um, and so I was working as a teacher for a while, and then I was working odd jobs, and I got the call that I'd forgotten I'd even applied for the library. <laughs> I was working another job um, at a juice bar and walked outside, talked to the then regional manager and had an interview and I haven't looked back. I absolutely love working for the library. I started as a part-timer at Cordova where I was so lucky to meet all of the incredibly talented people working in children's, um, probably the hardest working children's librarian I know is there. Um, and everybody wanted to share what they were doing. There was English as a second language classes there. There were people doing gardening programs there. There was, I had my very first program as a part-timer there right before the pandemic. Um, so I'm glad I got one in. <laughs> <laughs> yes. From there, I moved to the Poplar White Station at the time, now Officer Red Library, um, where I met Jenna, um, and got to really expand what I was doing. Um, I've always been interested in ecology, so I started a garden at the Officer Red Library. So if you're ever there, I hope that the plants are doing well. <laughs> Remind someone to water them. Um, <laughs> and 
we were at this small library that people thought people would pass by and had said like, oh yeah, I've been driving down this road for 50 years. I never knew this library was here. Um, so trying to bring some color and some life to the front of that space was one of the first things that I really wanted to do. And then about a year and a half ago, I moved to the Central Library with Jenna, uh, <laughs> where we briefly shared a very small office um, before finding our our final positions, um, her in humanities and I in sciences. And so I landed at the doorstep of the Seed Library, which I who knew? A perfect place. Um, so now I do a lot of programming inviting local farms and people who are working in ecology to come and talk about what they're doing and how to build more you know, resilient communities through food security. And of course, during that time we were spent in that tiny office, we started the Library of Things to, you know, build out even more non-traditional collections. You'll notice neither of us has talked about a book yet. I was about to say, yeah, uh, we've talked about all kinds of things like physical spaces, teen resources, um, seeds and ecology. That's things. right. Yes. Yeah. So the seed library you mentioned. Seed library. All year round, we keep it stocked with donations increasingly from the community. We had a very nice donation from the Memphis Botanic Garden this year. Um, so there is locally grown um, and seed saved okra being grown all over town, as well as a bunch of other plants. Um, could you paint a picture for us um, for anyone who hasn't visited the Seed Library? It, it's it's a great experience, very tactile. Uh, but you know, could you describe it for us? Yeah, yeah. So the Seed Library, you come up to the third floor of the Benjamin L. Hook Central Library to the Business Science floor. Um, walk right past the desk with the smiling faces of my coworkers, <laughs> um, and there's a little sign up sheet. You can give recommendations at the table. And just beyond that is an old card catalog, um, probably one of the two or three that's left in Central, um, where each of the little drawers is labeled with a kind of seed, um, and you can flip through to find exactly what you're looking for. To, and we try to keep it seasonally stocked, so, you know, greens and such in the winter, and your annual veggies in the spring, and it's free for the taking. All we do is ask that at the end of the year, if you do save some seeds, just bring some back. I was So I didn't know about the seed library until I started doing a little bit of research for this conversation, which, again, is proof that the library just has so many amazing opportunities for programming, including books, but also not just books. Um, and I was like, well, how does a seed library work? You can't borrow a seed. So to that point, I was like, I bring my plant back. But <laughs> yes, so to bring back the seeds, um, any leftovers or any that, you know, your produce produces, mm -hmm. really, um, and bring it back so that you can share it with someone else. Yeah. People bring them back in little baggies and jars and pill bottles, really in any kind of way that you can. Or, you know, you went to the nursery a few too many times and you bought too many seed packets and you know you're never going to plant them. You can bring those back, too. Um, Welcome all seeds. <laughs> absolutely. We do a seed saving program now. Uh every year in the winter and then at in the beginning of the year we're going to be doing uh, another seed our annual seed swap um to get you ready for the spring how fun yeah this was started in 2016 with the help of the ut agricultural extension office and then memphis tilth rest in peace memphis mm -hmm. tilth. Mm -hmm. um, and we still work with all of the incredible people who made that organization what it was um, because they're all still doing incredible work around town. Um, and you guys just talked to the works, I think, and, mm -hmm. you know, we work with Annalise and Theo um, from them. So Yes, the yeah. works is also doing amazing things. Yes. There's such a through line of community in everything that you've mentioned before. And so in addition to the library, uh, the seed library, you have the library of things, so Anna, just, just, you know, we danced around it a little bit, but let's dig into it. It's not just books that are housed in the library. What, what is the library of things? Where did it come from? Why do we have it? So it's basically uh, some non-traditional items that you can check out as if like kind of in the same way as books, um, whether it be 
like a sewing machine or a soil tester or even a bread machine. Um, we've got we've got it all. <laughs> um, so basically, the idea is that instead of going out and buying something, you can borrow it from the library, and maybe it's a hobby that you kind of want to start up, or maybe it's a tool that you've never used. You don't have the money to purchase it. This is a great way for you to try it out, um, and also maybe. Um, a little bit of less consumerism as well, yeah. you know? Um, I read somewhere that we only use about 20% of the items in our home every year. Oh, wow. So maybe instead of getting something that's going to collect dust in the corner, you can come to the library and check it out and try it out. I love this idea. It is truly not just borrowing to get knowledge, like from books and things, mm -hmm. but like having access to experiences. Um some of the things that I saw on there, like you mentioned, like gardening tools, crafting supplies, cookware, mm -hmm. home improvement tools. Um, I saw a movie projector. So if mm -hmm. you know you didn't can't get to the drive-in during the summer months, you can prop it up in your backyard and have a little movie experience. So things like that are just really exciting for Memphians, I think, to be able to have access to something like that, no matter what funding is available to you. That was when we were first putting together that first collection, so we've had two collections so far. Um, the first one was the Joy Collection, which included the movie night kit, like you said, um, as well as like a backyard camping kit, nature exploration kit. Uh, <laughs> Yard games. Oh, and, yeah, like bocce ball, like, yeah, <laughs> yes. bag toss. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, a karaoke, karaoke machine. machines. Yes. Ah. These ones, a lot of the what kind of brought those together was working with, uh, Link two one one's Kim, um, to who is our you know incredible resource at the library and the Mid South um, for all things social services, and the just talking about having access to things that people in the city might have never even thought they could have access to, um, like camping, you know, and it's just right there. You don't have to go to REI or something. You can go to the library, check it out. And camp in your backyard, maybe an experience you never thought you could have. Um, yeah. And of course, you mentioned a bunch of these other things. Um, so our second collection was the Get It Done collection. So all of these crafting supplies, like a crochet uh, crochet set. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about crochet. <laughs> um, I've seen the like hoops for like. Yeah, uh, we have some it? embroidery like, hoops. Embro I was like, yes, and needle pointing or whatever. Yeah, I was like, you need those for that. I know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's just stuff like uh, like thermal um, imaging cameras so you can check for heat leaks in your homes. Um, the library used to have, or check for ghosts. You know, <laughs> you can yeah. do whatever you want with sure. it. Sure. Um, Depending on the time, yeah. <laughs> Halloween's coming up. Yeah. That's right. Uh, or a simple bag of tools. Um, again, you don't need the drill every day of your life. You need it once every six months. To, hopefully, yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just putting tools in people's hands um, that, you know, you can borrow your neighbor's tools. And the library is everyone's neighbor. So you should be able to borrow stuff from us too. You know, we lend you our books. Um, we lend you our space. You know, why come not? hang out. Yeah. So why not lend other stuff too? So how did this get started? Is this being done in other libraries? Is this pretty common or is it less common, you think? I would say that it is increasingly common. Okay. Um, but it is not terribly common yet. Okay. Um, the Library of Things like premise has been around for a pretty long time. Um Certainly, it comes out of ideas like tool libraries. Mm -hmm. So, like Memphis City Beautiful has a tool library that you can have. You can check out. Uh, air quotes for check out from Memphis City Beautiful. Um, you don't need a library card to talk to them, but <laughs> uh, you know, shovels or uh, wheelbarrows or safety equipment like that. Yeah, a lot of like home like Lowe's Home Depot places like that you can I think rent tools but th there's certainly a fee attached right. to that as well which is you know a barrier of entry for and, a lot of people so you just need a library card to access the library of things that's right um, wow 
and there's no fee. Um, there's no late fee, just like everything else in our collection since November of 2019. Um, so if you have something out there, you can just bring it back. It's okay, I promise. Um, and <laughs> this is yes, we have a lot of that people that well. are scared. <laughs> bring it back. Fee. Just bring it back. That's please. all it takes. That's all. Um, so yeah, it's just things. So back in 1990. The North Branch Library actually started the first tool library in the Memphis Public Library system. Um, so I didn't start from scratch when, you know, I proposed we start this project. And I think that's what kind of piqued your interest was we saw all these tools in our catalog and it's like, there's a story there. <laughs> yeah. And people buy things for like doing programming all the time and it ends up sitting in a drawer somewhere. And just like a lot of the things in our lives, things just get bought. You know, you had good intentions for it, and maybe you'd used it once or twice, and then it sits somewhere. So why not activate those for the community? Um, yeah. So the North Branch Library still has a couple of items in their <laughs> tool library. You can still go get a aerating tool, a little pitchfork from them. I checked it out last year, turned my compost with it, so it's still there. <laughs> um, most of it is long since gone, like most things from the library. They don't last 30 years, but, um, especially with regular use. But, mm -hmm. um, after that, there were a couple of other big initiatives throughout the MPL's, like, lifespan. So we had a program with MLG and W with the kilowatt program. So there's these little things that you plug into your sockets to see, um, how much energy the things you have plugged into your sockets is taking and if you have a like a little energy leak or um, you know something could be adjusted to be more efficient um, and they did programming with us and we checked out a bunch of these items um, and so one of the big things was to like bring all of these things together in an organized and like centralized place uh, the other thing the ukulele is one of our um, our old coordinators uh, got every library branch of ukulele. Um, and so we have a bunch of ukuleles you can check out. But all these collections were disparate and they get forgotten about. And so bringing them all together and expanding their function was like, I think, the core idea. That and Nashville just opened their library of things. <laughs> so we really needed to hurry up and get it done. <laughs> uh, Always. Nothing like a little healthy competition That's to kind right. of get a project across the finish line. <laughs> so are all of the items located at the central location? So, Or how do we access them? Right. Good question. Uh, yes, they are located at central. And uh, we also have a collection at south. Um, to check them out, you do have to go to the library that you are checking out from. And you have to return that item there to as well. To library. Okay. Yes. So you mentioned, Anthony, a little bit of how some of the items were sourced because the library had acquired them for other programming or over the years to do different things or with specific partnerships, like you mentioned, with MLGW mm -hmm. and things like that. But otherwise, how are items sourced? Like when people go to the website, which you can do and I have done, to suggest items for the library of things, is it also helpful to, for someone to give you a contact information or, you know, hey, like I have a source or potentially here or there like how are things sourced you were the first person to put contact information really into that suggestion box <laughs> leave it to me to be to be that person <laughs> uh, which was incredible we really should have put something in there to request people give their contact information because i'd love to talk to some of the people with some of their recommendations or tell them like oh you think we should have ukuleles in the collection well boy do i have information for you <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love it. But so how are things? Yeah. So once ideas are there or once you have kind of a wild hair to be like, hey, we should have, you know, not just ukuleles, but we should have more than a dozen harmonicas or whatever it is. Fill in whatever blank. How do, how do you go about acquiring those things to add to the library of things? Or, or where does the funding come from to acquire those things? Right. Good so uh, the Memphis Library Foundation is who has been funding us for the last two iterations of this collection. 
Um, and yeah, it's really through them that a lot of our programming throughout the library gets funded. And they're very generous with allowing us uh, to kind of just run with it. They're very willing to uh, support us with whatever endeavors um, we want to do. Um, I think at the end of the day, they just want to know that we're trying to provide good service to our community and um, providing access to, um, to everyone in our community. Are you able to share a little bit about the relationship between the Memphis Library Foundation and Memphis Public Libraries and where that funding breaks down? Yeah. So the public library is the Memphis Public Library is essentially three different things. Um, it's the city of Memphis who pays our salaries. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> um, everybody and your tax dollars. Uh, there's that wing, you know, that keeps the lights on, all of the the basic foundational stuff. Um, and then every branch has a Friends of the Library, mm -hmm. um, which is a sort of volunteer run organization. They run an Amazon store where all of your lovely donations um, may get sold up. They run the bookstore, the second edition's bookstore at Central Library um, and do the big um, book sale every year mm -hmm. and almost certainly there is a small book sale at your local library branch um, so you can happily support them um, all support for the branch friends of the library essentially stays right there at that branch so when you cool. frequent your local branch um, you're helping that branch directly um, through the friends of the library and then there is the memphis library foundation which was founded in 2001 um, to construct, essentially, uh, to get the capital, to raise the, the private capital. Um, it's a nonprofit, essentially our fundraising arm, mm -hmm. um, that uh, was created to build Central Library um, because we just didn't have the funds in the city budget to build such a large and ambitious building at the time. Um, at the old fire zone, uh, fire. Auto, is at the old auto zone um, uh, headquarters there on Poplar. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where they started. And of course, now they continue doing events um, to fundraise through the community. And they're constantly supporting every large, crazy idea we get um, at, the, at the library. You, you know, you write a little grant. Um, and see if you get your idea approved and see if they bite <laughs> yeah and most of the time they do they love you know going for any of the you know they love seeing excited people putting the resources to work in the community like jenna said they are really are an incredibly supportive organization um and so is the friends i mean like just about every crayon you've seen at uh your library probably got bought <laughs> by some friends dollars um so love that that's so fun. So it's a very collaborative through these like volunteer, nonprofit, and city um, agencies. And I think that is really unique for the um, Memphis Public Library um, just because of the way that so many different things come together to make things possible. I feel like I've been hearing so much about collaboration in every aspect of like what makes the library possible, makes it run, the programming and things like that. What role do you think a library plays in a community? I mean, the library is a hub of community. I talked just earlier about it feeling like we're everybody's neighbor. Um, in a lot of ways, it feels like we're everybody's computer room, we're everybody's living room, um, you know, where sometimes we're just the friend you call when you're lonely, um, where everybody's Google, you know? Yeah. yeah. So it's a place where just about whatever needs you might have, uh, if you come, we might be able to help. Um, and even if we can't, we'll try. So, I don't know. To me, it's that constant willingness and the usual capability um, to help no matter who or what um, comes through the door, you know? Uh, 
Yeah, because even if you don't know the answer, there's probably someone in the building that's going to know the answer. So I think um, that's a way that we collaborate as a team um, is to try to work together and uh, figure out whatever problem someone is facing. I think a large part of what I do daily is help people on the computer, filling out resumes, uh, filling out unemployment. Um, that's really like one of the biggest things that we do day to day. Um, and I love that we provide that access um, to people that need it the most. And and it's so like really anything. So just just yesterday, somebody had like a question about their new health insurance mm -hmm. and came to the desk. They said, I thought you could help me. Well, I tried. And I think I did. Yeah. Um, or somebody was trying to get their partner from, I don't know, Ghana, and they needed some help navigating the immigration uh, like website, which I did not do anything in particular to help with that. <laughs> that is against the law. I'm not an official preparer. <laughs> but, you know, basic tech support stuff for absolutely anything. Mm -hmm. And like that, with so much online now, it is such a necessary resource. Um, we may not have the fastest computers, but they will always be there, um, and they're necessary. I mean, you need it for just about every government service. You need it for just about every job. You need it for just about every doctor's office these mm -hmm. days. So, um, you know, it's a place that people come when they need to, um, and I think sometimes after that, it's a place they come because they want to. Um, and again, like so much of what we end up doing is we see these problems and these like opportunities to help because we're dealing with people every day. So we partner with anybody who will have us. So we have Memphis Area Legal Services come um, every second Saturday. This year we've had like maybe five different legal clinics at Central every month, um, whether that be elder law or um, like a divorce clinic or the housing, Memphis Fair Housing Center. Um, and I think we'll have fewer of those in the coming year, but we'll always have our second Saturday, um, legal clinic. So, and that's just one of many, many, many organizations that is constantly <laughs> coming. Um, one thing I really learned in this work is that if you call somebody, they might just come to the library because people like the library, you know, they want to share what they've learned. They want to share what they do. Um, and they want to help. And it's a great place to help. Something that I have found personally to be true of the Memphis Public Libraries is, like you said, it's not only do I get to check out amazing books and have, you know, on my Libby, I have, you know, a million holds, not a million, I have 10, that's the limit, but, you know, um, <laughs> And have books on my Kindle, on the audiobook. I have, um, can check out physical books for me, um, spend a lot of time in the children's area. But there's also the, the access to all of the other things, whether it be ancestry and genealogy resources or um, my personal favorite when I was working over at Contemporary Media, we utilized the Memphis and Shelby County room mm -hmm. a lot because um, little known fact, I don't know, maybe it's a well-known fact, but the Memphis Press Cemeter um, archives are housed there. So that was a now defunct newspaper, but it has a lot of historical significance, even in modern day journalism, to be able to look back and see how the zoo was, you know, in 1960. How was this? What restaurants were available? What was this like? What was that like? To be able to fact check and um, have access to all of that stuff is not a given right. in any given community. Um, and so that is something that I wanted to just highlight for a second is I feel like y'all are not only the record keepers and like the history keepers, but you're the making sure that the storytelling becomes the culture and the history of a city and that so much of that is housed within the walls of the Memphis Public Libraries. Not just the keepers, the sharers. Right. I think that is one of the greatest things that I keep hear you, hearing you say is, you know, you're, you're welcoming curiosity, but you're also adding that human element of community. Most of us have access to, you know, a search forum or Google or websites, but for folks in our community who maybe aren't as able to access those things, you are the connection to the knowledge. And that's incredible. 
you're right about the the Memphis room um, on the third on the fourth floor at Central is our big archive of everything Memphis, whether it is like historical maps um, for if you're looking up like property lines going back hundreds of years, hundred yeah, hundreds of years, mm-hmm. um, or it's newspapers or it's old clippings or um, photographs. Photos. photographs. I love the photos. Yes. And the Dig Memphis arch- um, archives. We also have the like the story booth. So we are we've been getting long form interviews with Native Memphians about their personal histories um, all the time. So uh, we're building a really deep and have already built, I guess, a really deep uh, well of Memphis history there, and not just Memphis history. We're also a federal depository. So. I found the 1840 census for somebody in the basement the the other week um, because they were looking for historical data going that far back. And lo and behold, I found it. I found the physical book and I brought it upstairs to him. Um, so, yeah, there is just... Thank you for reminding us to talk about books. Um, <laughs> there is... Sometimes uh, the the catchphrase is that library is more than just books, so much more that it can be easy to forget about the books. Um, but we do. We have got incredible collections um, that you know boost literacy and give access to every kind of thing you could possibly want to learn. Um, we're constantly building those collections um, and like patching them up. We're focusing on own voices, so books that are about a kind of person or a kind of experience. We're increasingly getting books that are told from that perspective. Um, We relatively recently did a big diversity audit in the children's department um, for building out more stories about, you know, children of color or queer kids. Um, And at this point, I think that's really important. Memphis Public Library has been an incredible ally when it comes to that kind of thing. You know, Jenna and I are on the Pride Committee, which is a yearly, you know, we do our proud, Pride Out Loud uh, program now. Yeah. Are we still calling it that? I think so, okay. yeah. It's and annual every sub- September is whenever we have it uh, every year. And, um, yeah. Yeah. You know, International Paper gives us big, love them, really great partner. They're great. <laughs> we love uh, you, IP. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. A big chunk of money to give away a bunch of books. Yeah, um, not only for Pride, but also for Comic Con. Mm-hmm. So um, this year for Comic Con, we had lines out the door for our book giveaways, and we gave away um, almost three hundred books within the first hour. Wow! So we had at least that many people showing up that first hour for Comic Con for books. <laughs> That's fantastic. And there's, I feel like there's always something going on. You can visit the <laughs> library at your own pace any day, but there are constantly streams of activities like Comic-Con and Bookstock, and they're targeted for audiences, specific audiences, but also welcoming to anyone who's curious about the content. And you've talked about things for youth and children and emerging workforce, um, the kind of that age group, but you also have activities for seniors. We have a lot of activities for seniors. Um, we host an incredible number of the creative aging courses. Um, wonderful, wonderful resource. Yes. Again, thank you to the Memphis Library Foundation um, <laughs> for bringing creative aging to the library. Um, I have made some incredible connections with people through creative aging. Those teachers are so passionate. They love working with people. Um, and if you see a creative aging course and it's not completely full, and you don't meet the age requirement, just ask. You might be able to join. And honestly, sometimes that is the very most fun. I was about to say, don't tip me with a good time. We've had creative aging friends on the podcast before, and I was like, listen, your lineup looks amazing. It's incredible. <laughs> I'm jealous of the lineup that they continue to have. Um, yeah, last year I got to sit in on a Twilight Zone um, like session that they were having. It was like a weekly session where I got to go and watch Twilight Zone and we got to discuss Stop. the episodes and it was fantastic. This is so fun. <laughs> oh my word. Uh, and you have something coming up this weekend, right? Uh, the 19th. 19th yes. uh, is our senior health fair. We do it every year. 
um, where we have more than 60 different vendors from the healthcare industry and surrounding industries um, come. You can get sort of uh, free health screenings. It's targeted for seniors, but of course anybody is welcome. Um, learn all about how to make the most of Medicare and Medicaid and Medicare Advantage. Um, and really just come and, you know, meet a bunch of incredible people from the community, um, especially when it comes to taking care of your health. Um, Learn about resources, too. Resources. That's the thing yeah. is that sometimes you don't know something exists until you see it at, you know, an event like that. Mm -hmm. And understand that there are people who are ready and willing to help and aspects of whether it's your legal life, your health life, you know, things like that, um, that all of that kind of overlaps the older I feel like we get. And so making sure that you have all your ducks in a row is always helpful. And the library is always great for that. Are there any myths or misconceptions about life in a library <laughs> that you'd like to clear up? Jenna, do you want to take this one? Oh, um, <laughs> I think a lot of people think that we just read books all day. <laughs> Which would be fantastic, but... Um, or that you wear your glasses, like, really low on your nose, and yeah. you yell at anybody who, like... We're shushing people. Yeah, who, like, walks too loudly through the yes. halls. I think <laughs> a lot of people just think that it's not really a cool place to hang out. At least a lot of teens tell me that. And, um, yeah, I think we're just kind of going against the grain, trying to make sure that they know that, hey, we have all of these incredible programs happening, and, um, yeah, trying to chisel away at that um, that viewpoint that yeah. people seem to have. It's Libraries also, you know, biggest myth, library it's quiet. Uh, don't come to a library and expect it to be quiet. No. Library is for everybody, <laughs> and everybody means everybody. Um, so there's people having all kinds of different experiences. There's going to be kids, there's going to be teens laughing, um, you know, there's going to be somebody typing very loudly on a keyboard, it's people are living people are living their lives <laughs> um and i think you know the library is one of the last free places that you can just go be for as long as you want uh to do your work to just sit inside outside of this memphis heat to like browse the internet you know we're an internet cafe um if you want to think of us like that i think it's kind of fun to think of us like that i like that. it like that too yeah, yeah. that is fun <laughs> Um, and, you know, we're a reading room, we're a salon. Um, yes. <laughs> you can sit in the corner and Fancy. discuss your... I know, right? <laughs> Jenna's like, look at all these words we're messing around here. <laughs> Just breaking the stigma, you know? We're all these things. Um, and we're whatever you make of it. And if you have a big idea, you know, talk to somebody and maybe we can make it even more. You know, there's 3D printers uh, that you can use at the Cosset Library right here downtown. Um, they have a craft afternoon every week. Um, they're actually starting a podcast uh, <laughs> class. Maybe it's already started, but they're having a podcast class. They have a studio there, a little podcast studio. They have delicious food. They have delicious food from <laughs> Dos Hermanos. Mm -hmm. um, so it feels like Memphis is really innovating and breaking that stereotype to your point, Jenna, of like whatever you think a library is, Memphis is here to say, we're so much more than whatever you baseline think a library is. I think, too, that maybe when I was growing up, too, that <laughs> the libraries I went into were a little maybe stuffier. And so I love that it is so welcoming now and it does feel like you can just be who you are and mm -hmm. walk into the library as a free, accessible space, but also a place to your point, Anthony, to be curious. Yeah. And to your point, Jenna, to, to learn a new hobby, to check something out of the library of things, you know, maybe you want to learn to make like a seven layer cake and you're not sure how to do it. Go check out a cookbook. But then also you can check out the baking supplies that you need. Soon. Oh, soon. soon. <laughs> okay. A lot of library of things do have, uh, you know, uh, cake pans, uh, 
They'll be coming soon. Okay. We're building it incrementally, so there's always going to be new new things in there. So keep checking back. Keep checking back. But if you want to make, you know, gourmet ice cream or a loaf oh, of bread. Oh, a loaf of bread baking is like... We have bread machines and ice cream machines right now. That's right. Everybody makes their own bread now. Everybody makes their own bread. And made, we have all the good bread books, too. Ooh. It made me so happy that even before the collection, like, went out, we had people on hold waiting for the bread maker and the <laughs> ice cream machine. Isn't that part of Chef Eli's story, too, that he, um, the mobile library that came to Frasier, um, he would check out cookbooks and, like, learn to cook through that. And now it's, like, a full circle thing that he has his restaurant at Casa Library. So there you go. You know what our, you know, our new, our brand is start here. So... <laughs> You can always just start at the library um, to wherever you're going. Yeah. Okay. So now it's time for what we call the lightning round. Oh. <laughs> Don't be scared. It's fun. <laughs> so we have a couple of questions that are stream of conscious. So just answer the first thing that comes into your head. Okay. Are you ready? Are you ready to start here? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> the last item or book that you borrowed from the Memphis Public Libraries. Oh, um, mm. actually the thermal, uh, sensor, um, we were having some issues with, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the AC the other yeah. day and we actually went, I went down there and grabbed one and, um, I just checked to see how it was working <laughs> in the building. Love that. That's amazing. It's I working top notch. Great. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> what about uh, you, Anthony? Uh, last thing I checked out, uh, was a book about about cleaning my house. Oh. Um, <laughs> Feeling very Marie Kondo? You're going to like... Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. We do have all the Marie Kondo books. This wasn't one of them. The, this was uh, Miss Myers, the, the soap brand. Yes. Uh, branded like daily life hacky kind of stuff. Oh, I love it. Um, okay. How to clean this. You know, um, we've been moving lately. And so there's been a lot of downsizing and learning how to you know, build, you know, build a space together and, um, you know, keeping the home tidy and clean and just looking for fun tips on how to keep home, keep house. Because um, I, I like to keep the house. <laughs> What's something you've had your eye on in the library of things, but haven't borrowed yet? <laughs> well, for sure, the thermal imaging camera is something that I'd love to take <laughs> home. <laughs> Uh, it really should. <laughs> Is your new clean house possibly haunted? <laughs> uh, you know, I've been in this. Uh, you know, I've been in this house. We we moved in. Somebody's moved in, um, and my partner's moved in, and I've been in the house for a long time. I do not think it's haunted. Neither of us think it's haunted. <laughs> but there's only one way to find out. Very true. What uh, about you? Yeah. Um, probably the soil tester. I've tried to. I'm starting to get into gardening and. Um, I do not have a green thumb, <laughs> so got to go by the seed library and then grab the soil yeah. tester and just make a day of it. Absolutely. <laughs> um, something we always love to ask is why Memphis? Why Memphis? Because this is where I'm from. Um, this is a community of people who is constantly striving to do better and be better and to, you know, make new things. And I couldn't imagine being anywhere else. It's our little oasis in the corner of Tennessee, and it's my home. Ditto. Yeah. <laughs> I think you said that perfectly. Well, Jenna, Anthony, thank you so much for the work you're doing to bring our community together and just create cool, fun spaces for absolutely everyone. We are excited to see the Library of Things in action and watch it grow. And we appreciate you taking time to speak with us today. Thank you. Thank okay. you so much. So memphislibrary.org. Uh, you can find the calendar for all of our events. You can put holds on all of our books. You can look at the library of things and, you know. And suggest uh, new ideas suggest and new give ideas. contact information for who to contact. Yes, please. <laughs> and look at all our databases, including our new value line. I love it. Thank you. Independent Bank is celebrating 25 years of sharing your stories, building your dreams, and serving you heroically. Find out how iBank can help you achieve your financial dreams at i-bankonline.com. Member FDIC.